Hey everyone, this is X O'Connor and you're listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This week we are super excited to have Paul Coleman with us. Paul is an incredibly talented guitar player, artist, writer, and producer, working with acts ranging from his very own Paul Coleman trio to the Newsboys. What we love about Paul is how straightforward he is with everything in his life. He has an unwavering passion for life and for music that is nothing short of inspiring. He shares with us a story or two about his early days with the Newsboys, and he dives deep into the importance of not just making music from your heart, but living from your heart as well. He is currently using his wealth of knowledge, experience, and encouragement to produce young and up-and-coming bands, as well as mentoring young musicians looking to start a career in music. We were able to get him to lend us his point of view on most all things life and music, and we're super excited to share it with all of you guys. Two things, though, before we get into this episode, We just wanted to remind everyone that October will hail the start of our production series. We will be focusing on production in all the different parts of the music making process. And we have some very special guests lined up. So there will be something awesome for everybody. You're not going to want to miss any of it. And secondly, if you want to keep up with all the production based things we'll have happening in October, as well as all things full circle music, make sure to follow us on Instagram using at official FC music. All right, enough of all my chatting, guys. Let's get into this episode with Paul Coleman. Welcome back to the Full Circle Music Show. I'm X O'Connor. We are here in the Full Circle Music Studios. I am sitting with Paul Coleman, a lovely gentleman that I just had the pleasure to finally meet in Which person. Which is why you're saying lovely gentleman. Exactly. Because you have no idea. Well, you know, that's why we're here. We're here to get to know each other. I've Actually, heard the rumors. The truth is you met me post-therapy, so... These days, I am more of a lovely gentleman. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. There you go. I've heard the rumors. So we're actually here to find out if all the rumors oh, nice. are true. But so for any of our listeners that might not be super familiar with you, can you kind of give Which us your, most? Well, no, dude, you'd be surprised. We have I a diverse be. I would be very surprised. Our listeners are into it all, man. Okay. Can you give us just like a little bit of your history, your backstory, and what got you into music and, and getting you kind of where you are now? I was born in England. My parents took me to Australia when I was seven. I started playing music in my first band when I was 11. It was pretty hideous. Started writing songs when I was 11. Sort of was pretty disconnected kid. I like got really rejected, beaten up everywhere I went. I was pretty balanced. I had a chip on both shoulders. Let's just say that. <laughs> By the time I started writing music, I was playing in pubs. I wasn't playing in church buildings because in Australia, there's not that many. And Hillsong is an anomaly. Like there's only one place like that. Yeah. So I was playing in pubs, so I was expressing my thoughts and my faith, but they were three or four steps back from obvious because you can't sing Hillsong songs in an Australian pub if yeah. you want to stay alive. Yeah. So I did that like five nights a week and started writing my own songs and then traveled the world trying to get signed to a record label. Went to London, went to LA, went to New York, went everywhere and just nothing happened. And I got to a point of desperation and I was playing in theaters around Australia. By that time, sort of the Christian crew had sort of figured out that I was one of them. Mm -hmm. So they were coming as well. And then because I was pulling a decent crowd, anytime there was an American Christian act that came over, they would ask me to open for them. During that process, I opened up for a band called Third Day. They invited me and my band, the Paul Coleman Trio, mm -hmm. which I named... <clears throat> Aptly. Possibly a narcissistic phase. <laughs> <laughs> and so then that began the sort of journey to American Christian music. And after a few years of that, I just decided that it wasn't my audience. I loved Jesus. I loved music and I didn't mind money. But when they were together, it didn't make me comfortable. Yeah. So I took a few years off, but then sort of stayed in the fringes of that place and then joined the Newsboys for three years. If you've seen the John Christ podcast and you'll just believe it's the revolving door. But for me, it was an invitation. Mm -hmm. And after that, the last 10 years, I've been independent and traveling the world, still just doing my own music. That's awesome. So I was told before you got here today too, uh -oh. and uh, hopefully you don't mind sharing this, but Matt Hammett and I were chatting and he told me to ask you <laughs> yeah. about a motorcycle story with the Newsboys. Well, when you join the Newsboys, it's kind of like joining... I'm not sure if it's the mafia. I'm not sure if it's a, a company. I mean, those guys are all solid guys. And, you know, one way to judge your friends is 
if I was, if I did something wrong or if I was stuck on the side of the highway at 3 a.m., who would I call? Yeah. And I could call every single one of those guys. <laughs> That's you know, awesome. And they yeah. would look after me. They'd give me a kick in the butt or whatever. And, you know, so, so they're good guys, but they're tough monkeys, man. Yeah. So the first, they said, you want to get a motorbike? And I'm like, oh, well, you know, I like golf. <laughs> yeah, we don't play golf. You want a motorbike? And I said, okay. So the first ride I did was from Medford, Oregon to Susanville, California, which is about a 10 hour ride. And five minutes into the ride, up into the mountains of Oregon, starts snowing. I hadn't written. In, I hadn't written. I hadn't written in the rain yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, the they just left me. They just went. Their version of discipleship is see you when you get there. So <laughs> I rode by myself through three snowstorms, two hailstorms for nine hours. Oh my goodness! And I'd never. <laughs> it was my first main ride on a motorbike, <laughs> and I got there, and they were happy to see me. But they, it was pretty funny. But they're tough monkeys, you know. And it was kind of what I needed because. I've always been a bit of a wuss. Like I just kind of, a lot of guys like man's men, you know, they know yeah. how to back up a trailer. Yeah. They know where the real estate's at. They yeah. know where, what shares are. Yeah, yeah. They know how to fix a tire. Yeah. I wasn't that guy. You know, I've always been more on the sensitive side. I can sit and natter about any subject. <laughs> so actually being with those guys was really good for me. And I, and plus I'd never really played the guitar above the fifth fret without a capo. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so everything about being in that band was an incredible learning experience for me. It wasn't so much about anything to do with my career or about the audience. It was really for me, I'd come to the end of something. Yeah. And I needed to be in something that, that I wasn't in charge of. Because everything I'd ever done had my name in it from wedding bands to duos to my own band. Yeah. I'd always been in charge. I'd always been the main writer, the main spokesperson, the main guy. So this move actually really had not much to do with music. It was more therapy. Yeah. So you had mentioned like leading up to that, like right before, you know, you had kind of struggled with like putting money and your career and faith and all into one thing. What about joining the Newsboys kind of like ease that transition for you a little because bit Because I wasn't in charge of it. Yeah. But honestly, it still has me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I remember a few years ago, I was playing in Norway and I was playing in Oslo and the lady from the... I was playing in a town about 45 minutes north of Oslo. Yeah, yeah. And unless you're Springsteen, people in countries in Europe, they don't travel to see you. If you're 40 minutes away, they're like, well, I'll wait till he comes to my town, which is kind of cool because you can play yeah. in a thousand towns. And yeah. there's People at least turn they, up. They do. <laughs> yeah. Well... That's the theory. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> so I was there and this lady interviewed me from the local paper before. And she was an Asian lady and she said, oh, I'm a Buddhist. And I said, okay, I mean, congratulations. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And so she said, you know, I probably won't stay for the concert. And I said, oh, I don't blame you. That's fine. And she said, my first question is, what's it like to sing about your faith on a stage? And I said, it's terrifying. She said, why is that? And I said, well, Jesus of Nazareth said to keep it quiet. Yeah. He said to, when you pray, go in your closet. Don't stand like someone parading it on the street corners. Just live a life that is questionable. Live a life in questionable meaning. People ask you like, well, why do you yeah. take out everyone's trash in the street? You know, why do you, you know, yeah. why, why do you- Inspire questions. Yeah, yeah, why do you do this? And so I said, you know, I'm standing on a stage getting paid to talk and sing about my faith. I mean, that's, that's terrifying. And so I think I've always felt that maybe it's the Australian thing because Australians classically hate authority and religion. I became and still am enamored with Jesus of Nazareth, just the way he communicates, the way he did communicate in stories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he didn't sort of explain it all at the end. And this is what it all means. And yeah. here's the three points, like, you know, sad, salvation and whatever. Yeah, yeah he kind of left it hanging. Even his best mate, Peter, he said, who do you say that I am? Which means he didn't tell his best mate who he was. Like there's something about Jesus of Nazareth, this mystery. Mm -hmm. There's this sense of you have to spend time with him to yeah. understand who he is. What I've experienced in a lot of Christian culture is that if you're not clear, if you're not precise, people don't really trust that you're on the team. And I think, who are you following? Like, is it, Billy Graham or is it Jesus of Nazareth? So early on in my life, when I read the parables, I wanted to write like that yeah. in a way that someone might be sitting in the first row, not have this relationship with Jesus and still go, man, I like that. I like that melody. What's that about? 
as well as the guy in the 15th row who's read the teachings of Jesus and goes, I know exactly what that's about. Yep. That's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. In the same way as, you know, Jesus would draw people in with these stories. And yet one of the things that I found towards the end of my time in American Christian music is that that wasn't appreciated mm -hmm. at all unless it was clear, it really, what you weren't on the team. And we have these jokes, you know, about JPMs, Jesus per minutes. <laughs> and I'd gotten done with people telling me, I don't mind criticism. I yeah. don't mind correction. I don't mind authority and I don't mind a team. Yep. But darned if I'm going to shove his name into a song and get rid of the mystery. Yeah. So now the last 10 years, I, I kind of, not like shook the dust and thought, you guys are all idiots, I'm out of here. Yeah, yeah. I, I get, who am I to say that? It's mm -hmm. just more, you have to go, I answer to God, I don't yeah. answer to anyone else. So what do I feel like I'm supposed to do? Yeah, where's my journey taking right. me? And yeah. so, you know, 80% of my shows are in Europe. Now, I'm the first guy to stand up and share my faith. I may end up dying for that mm -hmm. at some point. I hope not. But what I mean is I won't compromise that. Yeah. But when it comes to art, when it comes to these things, I like subtlety, which is why I'm a Switchfoot fan. Yeah. You know, why I'm a fan of a lot of Jazz of Clay's music, why I'm a Derek Webb fan. Yeah. Why I'm a Steve Taylor fan. Yeah. I'm not a fan of the direct thing that feels quite linear where I understand it all in one go. Yeah. Having said that, I want to make it very clear that I'm not criticizing anyone else's music, art, or thinking. Yeah. I am saying this is for me. Absolutely. And... I think one thing, you know, I started working in Christian music early 2000s with a producer named Pete Kipley. Mm. And so one thing I think we definitely found was a lot of what you were talking about, like things had to be very in a uniform direction, like mm. th labels wanted to hear a certain thing, radio wanted to hear this certain thing. And it was a kind of a struggle at first to like put things into that piece because you know at that time early 2000s you know he and I are listening to Muse and we're listening to Snow Patrol and stuff like that all these like really cool really unique records mm. out of these you know bands that are coming out of the end of the grunge period and then the early you know late 90s early 2000s lull of where there's like mm. you know there's some like active rock stuff but nothing like that's just like blowing anyone's minds and then right. these cool like bands with a totally unique sound start emerging. And it's like, mm. why can't we make music like that? Why are right. we making any genre of music? Why aren't we just making music? Right. And I feel like that trend has now continued into where like, especially with the internet and all the streaming services, like the boundaries are getting really blurred. And now I think there's starting to become a lot more strength in the song rather than like, oh, is this a genre? Is this saying this specific thing? It's I think like, you may be right. And once again, yeah, I know. I'm not Come an on. authority. I actually really on anything. So this is more a thought. But I think maybe musically you're right, but I don't think lyrically that's okay. still true. People always say to me, oh, Paul, that's just semantics. <laughs> the irony of that is that I'm going to be what they call semantical about the word semantics because the word semantics means the root meaning of words. What they really mean is pernickety or persnickety, yeah, which, yeah, yeah. which is being silly about words. But semantics is actually looking at the root meaning of words. So I think like when you think about a word like radical, uh -huh. radical in the Latin means root. Like someone who's a radical gets to the yeah. root. It's not a haircut. You could be a radical and wear a three-piece suit and work on Wall Street and you could be conservative and dress like a punk and ride a Harley. Yeah. If you keep doing the same thing, it's conservative. Radical is someone that looks for the root. So Jesus was a radical because whenever he spoke to, he got to the root of it. So when you're working on a track, uh -huh. when you're working, and like I remember working on this track a few years ago for an amazing artist out of New England called Jonas Woods. And he'd laid the vocal and an acoustic guitar. And I spent three days on my own putting all this instrument down. Mm -hmm. And as I listened to it, it just didn't move me. So I muted 72 tracks and I just listened to his vocal for half an hour. Yeah. And then at the end, the song ended up being piano and cello. In the same way, when we look at words, when we look at culture, we've got to feel free to mute everything. Yeah. Because you've got to look for the root of what, what's the problem. So in other words, I was meeting with my pastor the other day and I said to him, I need you to help me. Why do I feel like I'm better than everyone all the time? And I'm not, but I want to know why I think that. Why have I got this critical spirit? So he starts to go back through the root of it. So I'm, I'm practicing what I'm preaching here. I, yeah, yeah. I've been looking for this stuff. So when I look at where the holdup is, because most Christian artists you talk to would love to write about more than about seven words. Yes. They would love to write about their bad marriage. They would like to write about other things. 
they get frustrated with having to put it in the box. Mm -hmm. So then you go, okay, without pointing fingers, where's the holdup? Where is it? And I don't think it's radio and mm -hmm. I don't think it's the music industry. I think it's the pulpits. Mm -hmm. I think that the teaching is coming from the leaders of the churches to teach people how to think. If they all stood there and said, hey, listen, everyone in this room has problems. Everyone in this room has darkness. Everyone's been in the valley. In this room, there's people with sexual problems. There's people with financial problems. There's people on the brink of divorce. There's people that struggle with shame and guilt and pride and lust all in this room. And I love you all. And that's why we're here because we're sick. Mm -hmm. Don't we need some music that speaks to these things without having to tie it up in a perfect bow at the end? Yes, we do. Okay. See, if that was what was being heard, it would be different. But I think that there's this perpetuation of this experience that no one's really having. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's kind of like the, the emperor's new clothes. You know, everyone's looking at the king going, oh yeah, he's dressed. Yeah. Because they don't want to look foolish. They don't want to be the one that's not getting it. Sometimes it takes someone just to go, listen, dude, the king's naked. He's been duped. Yeah. So I think that that's where the holdup is. Having said that, I don't want to walk up to a pastor and say, dude, you know, you're holding everything up. Yeah. But I think there's this smallness of thinking. And I think everyone kind of knows it's that way. But for whatever reason, it's just fear that perpetuates this idea. I think people on in Christian radio probably want to play something that's a bit edgy, like the teachings of Jesus, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the first Christian artists I ever heard was Steve Taylor. Yeah. And I fell in love with Steve Taylor's music. You know, his album, I Want to Be a Clone. I asked the Lord into my heart. They said it was the way to start. But then I had to learn to play the part, I want to be a clone. Be a clone and kiss conviction goodnight. You know, this satirical, edgy lyric and Larry Norman. Mm -hmm. But it just got so safe. It eventually got so safe. And so now with the perpetuation of these words, just I find them hard to put together, but worship industry, mm -hmm. worship meaning music, or even though it's way more than that, it's like people have gotten used to a certain set of words. And if you write outside that, you're not going to get an audience. So you got to find some band that are trying to pay their bills what are they going to do? They're going to write within that genre, which perpetuates it again. And I understand why they do. Yeah. But if you get them on the back of a tour bus, they'll run around just with intense frustration that they can't really write about what's really going on in their lives. So I don't know if it can be fixed. I'm not sure. But I think that's where the holdup is. And once again, I'm saying this with honey, not vinegar. <laughs> so... To our listeners out there that are, you know, writers, uh, aspiring artists and all that stuff too. I mean, this is the kind of stuff, you know, that people definitely want to know about that are looking to move into the music industry. So for upcoming writers and artists and stuff like that, what would your advice to them be as they're looking to make music, regardless of genre, you know, a part of their lives in more of a full capacity? That's the thing. I don't know what to say. I don't know whether it can change. I think maybe if everyone just, you know, if, if we stop delivering these songs, then then maybe it'll change or maybe Christian music's not for you. The Part of the problem with the term Christian music is that if you put that word before the word music, you're almost telling people what they're supposed to experience. Mm -hmm. I don't say, hey, here's my rich friend. Here's my gay friend. Here's my Arabic friend. Yeah. Here's my old friend. I just say, there's my friend. Yeah. And if you want to get to know my friend, you get to know them. Yeah. So when people ask me, you know, what kind of music do you make? I say, it's good. Yeah. You know, I say, it used to be rubbish. Now it's good. You know, and I, well, what kind is it? I say, listen, dude, find out for yourself. I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. You want to find out? You got to do a bit of work, but we yeah. don't want to do that work. We want to immediately go, oh, that's safe because it's this. But I'm not sure what advice to give. I think in the end, you got to go with your gut. Yeah. And honestly, there are some people that I've met who when they sit down and they're being true themselves, the, the lyrics they come out with are kind of the lyrics that I'm having a go at. Yeah. Well, if that was the case and it was just those people, then it wouldn't be a problem. The problem is, is when everyone thinks that's what they've got to do and it's not really who they are. It's not those legitimate people, like the guys in Casting Crowns, I've played with those guys many, many, many times. I think Mark Hall legitimately is that guy that writes songs that really are acceptable to that American evangelical audience. Yeah. But I don't think he's faking it. 
Yeah. I think that's exactly who he is. That pours out of him. Just, I think that is yeah. him. I think he's legit. The problem is there's 50 other guys that listen to that, start writing that, and it's not really who they are. Yeah. And so you can feel it. You can. And you know what? Honestly, I did it too. It wasn't really who I was, and I did it. So if I could go back, I would heed my own advice, and that was stay with what you are, Paul. You know, some people are agitators. Some people have a prophetic thing, and it's awkward. Yeah. I've got told by everyone in leadership in my life that I have a prophetic quality. I wish I didn't. It's very awkward. Yeah. I don't want to see things the way I see them. I wish I couldn't because it makes it very difficult in relationships and you, because I'm always seeing like, whoa, hang on, something's wrong here. Yeah. I don't want to be that guy at the dinner party. I just want to be the guy that talks about real estate and talks about what we're fixing on our home and how we live in West Haven, <laughs> you know, and I, I want to be that guy, but I'm not. I have this agitation in me, comes out in my music, comes out in what I say. We need those people too. So maybe there are artists out there that the way you see the world doesn't fit in with the way other people do. Well, do this. Stay close to your pastor. Stay close to your friends. Read the scriptures every day. Have people in your life. Don't go out on your own and throw rocks at the church. Be still there. Be in the group. Be in the church. Serve the church. Yes. But lead and inspire. Be, be you. Yeah. And if it's awkward, stay there. If it's, yeah. Don't leave. And if you're someone that legitimately writes songs that are more vertical. They point to God, God, you're great, God, you're that. And that's who you really are. Same advice, stay with your pastor, stay with your yeah. friends, be friends with people that aren't like you. And if you're someone that writes lyrics that are very ambiguous, you do this, you do that, and really it's to God, but you want to be in the mainstream world because it's who you are, stay with your pastor, stay with your friends, read the scriptures, stay yeah. in the church, you know, still be in there. Be yourself. Be yeah. yourself, but you've got to be true to that. But that doesn't mean you run off and you start throwing rocks and, oh, that Christian artist, he sucks because he's not writing like me. And no, 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 no. Oh, that secular artist, he's not writing like me. He mustn't be on the team. Yeah. That's all got to go. We've got to stop that stuff because it's a body. Yeah. You know, and there's toes and there's ears and everyone wants to be the hands and feet, but there's a lot of other parts of the body, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and sure. some of them aren't really celebrated, but they're quite necessary. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know what I mean? You still stay in the team. Let's just yeah. be together. Yeah. Let's work this out together. But you got to be you. You know, don't just think that's because because that's what sells or that's what... Because it can change culture if enough people follow true to themselves. And I think that's the problem. So I don't know if that's advice. I really don't know. I have no idea. No, I think that's what I would think. You, you kind of started down something. I know that through our academy and stuff like that, we've talked about a bit. And it's like, yeah, blooming where you're planted a little bit in like in your strengths of like who you are. You are this person right. at your core. This is what you're good at. Do this thing because this is what's pouring out of you to do. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're, yeah, I'm not anything else. I'm me. And I'm doing this, and this is my passion, this is my love, this is what I want to do. Mm. Do it and flourish and, and with it. And the truth is, you'll get run out of some towns. Jesus did say, look, go into the town, stay with people, heal the sick, you know, preach the gospel. And if they don't listen, it wasn't like shake off the dust and, you know, run your key down their car as you leave. <laughs> but it's like, you know what, sometimes, you know, Jesus was run out of town by religious people. It, yep. was, it wasn't the hookers who wanted him dead. It wasn't the sinners who wanted him dead, was it? Mm. It was the politicians and the pastors who wanted him dead. So there is a chance that it's going to hurt. You know, so you got to have some mates around you. You got to get your mates, you know? Yeah. You got to have some peeps around you that get who you are. But I don't mean have a little group of three and, and have a bitterness against the church because Jesus leaves no room for unforgiveness, which sucks. <laughs> it's like, I mean, he doesn't leave. He even said, if someone's got a problem with you, go to them. Yeah. It's not like, well, I didn't do anything. <laughs> he leaves no room. He's, oh man, he's tough. You know, he's certainly not safe for the whole family. doesn't matter what Christian radio says. <laughs> There's nothing safe about someone that picks up an instrument of torture and says, do this. There's nothing safe about that. Yeah. I want to die in my sleep with three homes and a fat bank account and a yep. Harley and an Audi. I do. I really do. You know, I don't <laughs> want I don't want discomfort. I don't want any of that. But the fact is he said, pick up your cross and follow me. In other words, I'm inviting you to die. Mm -hmm. 
but yet, yet we say safe for the whole family. I'm like, dude, I don't know who you're reading, but he's safe and he's extremely dangerous because he'll get to the very core yeah. of your life and he'll say, Paul, you are hanging on to this bitterness. But write about it while it happens. I'll tell you right now, I've sung in all 50 states of America. I've sung in two to 15 cities in every state. I've sung in 50 other countries in the faith community. And my impression in all these places that people are like me, underneath it, they're still not 100% convinced that God loves them just the way they are. And sometimes I think we haven't had the revolution that we're hoping everyone else has. And so just know when you write those songs and you look out there, people are like you. They need to know that God loves them. They need to know that no matter what they do or say, they are loved. They're carrying shame. They're carrying guilt. They're carrying all these sort of things. And But just remember the song doesn't have to go, I know your shame, I know your guilt, but Jesus, Jesus fixes everything, Jesus. It's okay to leave it hanging. It's yeah. okay to let God close the deal. I think that religious culture, and forgive me, but we're allies, but particularly yeah. in this country, feels this incredible need to have to resolve everything at the end. And if you go back and read the teachings of Jesus, he doesn't do it mm -hmm. because he knows that the Holy Spirit will close the deal. But I think we're slightly terrified to leave things open. It's kind of like we open it up and then we have to close it up. And the thing is, it, it, Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't run after the rich young ruler. Oh, it's okay, buddy. It's okay. He lets him go. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe that guy turns around in six months' time and becomes one of the 72. Maybe ends up being martyred for his faith. We don't know the end of the story. But Jesus doesn't run after him. And he lets the Holy Spirit of God close the deal. So I think as songwriters, one of our job is to open up the heart and leave room for the ambiguity. Yep. But I think we're slightly terrified to do that because our pastors don't talk that way. Everything they say is tied up in a neat little an acronym at the end of the service or it's like, well, don't worry, Jesus fixes everything. And I think people are sitting there going, you know, I don't know if he does. I've had these migraines for 27 years and yep. I've prayed and I've been anointed with oil and I've been to every faith healer. And I don't know, but, but when they listen to the music on the radio, they're like, oh, well, it must be me. I must be something wrong with me because everything seems to resolve okay for these people. Work out your issues with the church. Yeah. There's just a bunch of people like you who are busted up. Yeah. I mean, we're all hypocrites. That's why we go, right? Yeah, and discussion is Work one of the most out. powerful tools, you know? Yeah, like, it's, scripture says iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Well, there's going to be sparks. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah, we're all in this thing together. Yeah, we need to get better at working out conflict too. I think we're really good at singing about God's love now. We kind of got that down. We probably don't need any more of those conferences. We might need a few on how to apologize. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not as sexy though, is it? Yeah, well, so now that, you know, you've kind of shared with us your take on how, how you approach music and everything. So as you're an artist, you know, music maker, writer, producer these days, how do you go about finding artists to work with or when you're writing, when you're sitting down to just like to zone in, where's your mindset as you're creating music for this generation and, and in this current Fortunately, climate? Fortunately, I really don't have much of a career in terms <laughs> of like, I don't have a label. I don't have a manager. I don't have an agent. I don't have a road manager. I don't have an, an established band. I got rid of all that stuff. And you know what? They were happy to get rid of me at the same time. It wasn't like I was selling a lot of records. I begged my record company to let go of me. And halfway through, they go, yeah. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, like, wait a minute, you guys were supposed so to put I don't, a little I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> you could have at least waited to the end and put on a sad face just to pretend. <laughs> so I don't really have to satisfy a genre. I don't have to do that. I can write whatever I want. And the people around the world that like my music buy whatever I put out. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not that many, really. I'll be honest, I, it looks much better on Facebook than it is. I only take pictures from on stage to the sellouts. You know, I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't take it of an empty room. Yeah. You know, I'm not stupid. <laughs> Maybe I should. <laughs> so I don't, when I approach music, I'm really saying whatever I want to say. Yep. Now, having said that, I've got a bunch of co-writers and friends that I run things by yeah. and say, is this any good? And I've had friends that have said, oh, I think that, I know what you're trying to say there, but it just comes across as critical. It yeah. doesn't sound edgy. It sounds like you, you're being a jerk. Yeah, argumentative as opposed to inspiring. Right. Yeah. So, and, I'll, and I'll take that out. Mm -hmm. 
I had a line in the song on my last records that, that said the president's golfing. And it wasn't meant to be, he's wasting all his time golfing. It was like some, the bombs are going off over there and the president's golfing. It wasn't meaning he's not allowed to go play golf because the dude's got to have a day off. Yeah. But my friend said, I know what you're trying to say, but that just sounds critical. And it sounds like you can't talk about the president because you're not a citizen. And I went, oh yeah, good call. So it's not like I don't, ju yeah. I run things by people, yeah. but I don't have to satisfy a genre. Do you find that there's strength in having a sounding board to bounce ideas you off You gotta of? have it. Yeah. If you want to be great, you gotta have people. You know, <laughs> there's only a couple of princes and stings. I mean, yeah. you know, most of us need a team. <laughs> yeah. When I was younger though, when I was a young writer and I said, what do you think of my song? I really was saying, tell me I'm awesome. Yeah. I didn't want to know what you thought. I didn't want to know at all. Yeah, I just wanted looking you, for a yes. Yeah, I wanted you yeah. to go, yes, you're amazing. Yeah. You're the greatest ever. So I think you do need people around you to help you say it better and think better. But I don't have to worry about that these days. I don't have to please anyone besides people who are helping me make it great because there's no gatekeepers in what I do. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. But I mean, even even with no gatekeepers though, just having a trusted person that you can just... Oh, more than Be one. Be like, yeah. hey, they're going to point you in it. Like, whether it's easy to hear, not easy to hear, they're going to point you in the direction. They're going to let you know. What's... I think in the end, if you want to be great mm -hmm. at something, you realize that you need help. Yeah. I mean, look at all the, the PGA Tour golfers. They've all got coaches. They've yeah. got swing coaches. They've got putting coaches. They've got short game coaches. You know, this Tiger Woods has a coach. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hello. Yeah. yeah. You know, Conor McGregor has a coach. Yeah. So why don't musicians have coaches? Yeah. It's kind of crazy. We're, no, we're fine. Yeah. We're good. We have this <laughs> gift. And it's like, yeah, nah. <laughs> well, and you can see it through just, I know you've worked with artists that, you know, younger artists or whatever, and you've been a younger artist yourself. Yeah, as you're... I didn't listen. Yeah. Just so you know. Yeah. I didn't take the advice that I give. I was pig-headed, arrogant, and I thought I knew it all, and I didn't listen, which makes me great at working with younger artists because... I know what not to do now. Yeah. No, exactly. And I think <laughs> an experience I know I've had when I've worked with younger artists, like you, you find this weird point where some younger artists act like what they think really establish acts, especially like on the mainstream side of things. They see all these huge like heavy metal bands and all this stuff. They hear all these like crazy stories and they're like, okay, I have to act like that because right. the whole image is me being this rock star that right. that, that is. But then now working in music, like I've, I've dealt with the kids that come in and trash the place and, you know, do that whole thing. But then I've had the opportunity now to work with the bands that those people were trying to emulate. Right. And it couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah, they the come in and they're like the, the nicest dudes, the most professional dudes right. that are like, no, we've got families, we've got this. Yeah. It's like, I would love to be done by 630. <laughs> I'm going to do everything that I, in my power to like, I'm going to give you everything you need before then. We're going to go have right. a nice lunch. We're going to yeah. get this thing done. And at the end of the day, like even as organized and laid out as that sounds, it's more passionate. It's harder. It's like you, you can't ask for something better. Like some of these country records we're doing these days. Like when I first moved here, one thing that really blew my mind about country music was that you could have singers because back then, a lot of artists in country music weren't writing their own songs. There That's were right. the, you know, the here and there, yes, they were writing their tunes. But for the most part, I was involved in sessions that had the writers there and then the artist was there as well right. to kind of, you know, the writers there to help, you know, translate anything mm. that needs to be translated or whatever. But to hear a singer sing a song that they had no connection to, had not been like, you know, heart-wrenching songs that they had not been through that experience. Some of them are singing songs about kids and these guys aren't even married, don't right. have children. But that singer could make you be like, holy cow, this guy's been it. through the... Yeah, I believe it. That was an insane gift that I like, because you think it's easy, but then you hear someone that's not right. good at it. Someone that's an amazing singer, but they sing that same thing. And it's just like, I don't get, I don't buy that. Right. You know, it's just mind blowing. That, that, that's the thing. And I think in this day in music too, you can definitely hear, as we were talking earlier, the heart's just got to be in it. Right. For anyone writing that's out there right now, just pour yourself out in it, you know? And if that, like you were saying, if that's worship music and vertical and that's who you are, embrace it and run with it. But if it's, you know, if that's not who you are, don't be afraid to be who you are. Right. Because we need that. Yeah. You know, we need, we need more than just lasagna yeah. on the table. I love lasagna. Though, Me too. We do need why it. I chose it. Yeah. But we need salad. 
Yeah. You know, we need bread. The medical people tell us we need salad. I'm still not entirely convinced. <laughs> well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that sometimes when you look at Christian music, it's a valley of lasagna. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a delicious valley of lasagna. That is a sound bite. <laughs> That's a sound bite that you're going to take. Paul Coleman, Christian music is a valley of lasagna. <laughs> That'll be on my gravestone. And it's like... Right. I, I've seen worse things. <laughs> yeah. We, we need the differences. And it takes guts to do that. Mm -hmm. It takes guts to swim against, you know, it takes guts to be that little kid that says, actually, you know, the king's naked. Yeah. Like he's been duped and we all know it. It takes courage to do that. Yeah. And we need to create an environment where people can be courageous. And sometimes we create an environment where it makes it really hard on people that have an individual spirit, that have something different to say, and yet we need that. Yeah. You know, for every artist that is, if you listen to a band like you too, when they name their influences, you listen to them, you're like, Oh my gosh, like Ultravox? Yeah. Really? Like he was listening to Tin Machine when he wrote that record? Or, you know, but without that edgy artist out there, that would have never created this other artist. So we need, we need everyone. We need the full meal. Yeah. You know, we need everything. We don't just need the lasagna. Yeah, all the pieces of the puzzle need to yeah, be Yeah, we there. need all that stuff. So if that's you, be that person. But once again, don't, run off on the side and have your own little pity party because no one understands. Yeah. Stay connected. Like stay connected. Stay on the team. That's the hardest thing to do is to stay there. You know, yeah. I, I don't attend my local church because I love church services. I don't love them. I really don't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. But I go because I need to go. I need to be a part of something. And just because it's not my cup of tea, the music might not be my cup of tea or when that preacher's on or that one on. So what? Get over yourself. Yeah. There may be someone there today that needs a hug or you may need to hear something. Yeah. So don't don't leave. Stay on the team. We, we yeah. need you. Yeah. But you still got to be yourself. And that there's tension in that. Yeah. But, but I think, you know, after all these years of me leaving, mm -hmm. as I said, I've done everything the wrong way. So I know what the right way is. Like I'm divorced. You know, I know what not to do. Yeah. <laughs> so why do you think <laughs> God's given me a whole bunch of young guys that come to my house for advice you think it's because I know what to do? No, it's because I know not what what not to do. Yep. And I help these guys stay married. Yeah. So, you know, when I say I'm broken and God's put me back together, I'm not kidding. Like yep. I'm, you know, there was no foul play in my marriage, but my wife ended up getting to the point where she said, I don't think you'll ever change and I can't stand being around you. That's pretty brutal. Yeah. You should listen to my last two records. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's brutal. You failed in loving the person that you were given as the most important person. Now, some of it's her, some of it's me. Well, yeah. Whatever's her is her lane. I don't stay in that lane, but I can look at me. So, you know, in the same way with writing, like I wanted to be everything. I wanted to be the writer, the singer, the producer, the everything, because I had this vacuum of rejection where I needed control. And instead of realizing, hey, Paul, you're good at this thing, like the singer on the session and the old country records. Hey man, you know what? You didn't write this and it's okay because you can sing it. And the writer, hey man, you wrote this, but you can't sing it. Knowing your sweet spot, knowing your gifts, knowing your place yeah. and not needing to project all over other areas. There's a freedom in that, but I'll be honest with you. There's a trust too. I did not have that yeah. when I was younger. I did not have that. I was, my hands were super glued to the wheel of control. In, in the end, <laughs> even God couldn't pull my fingers off. He just cut the steering column off and put me in the back seat. <laughs> so, you know, he just put me in the back seat and said, listen, can I get it? You know, sit back there. And so I'm steering, but it's not even connected to the car. Yeah. And then eventually I went in for the surgery. Apparently I learned that it was something you had to volunteer for. Yeah. <laughs> so now- You had to, you know, be, you had to want it. Right. Yeah. I've, I've still got the scars of that super glue on my hands. And yet God's given me the work of maybe mentoring some people who are like me and just saying, hey, listen, buddy, I'm for you. Yeah. I'm in your camp. I love you. Yeah. But you got to let go of that. You know, because in the end, that control is fear and perfect love casts out fear and God is not fear. You got to let that go. So even though I don't really have a, an established career in music, but I do have sort of pockets all over the world where people appreciate what I do. I'm really glad I failed at what I was trying to achieve 
because I don't think it's what I like anyway. I like people. Yeah. You know, I, I don't stay in hotels. I stay in people's houses. I don't like tour buses. I don't really like arenas. The bigger something gets, it looks sexy, but the less influence you have. My gigs are like 50 to 250 people. And I stand in the lobby when people walk in. I don't stand backstage yeah. because I like people more than music. So I'm content in my life. I've got to that point of like, you know what? It's all good. I trust God now. But it's been one heck of a journey. And I do like working with younger artists because I love the opportunity to help them yeah. learn what I didn't learn so yeah. that they can be better. Yeah. Well, that's one thing we talk about a lot here yeah. at Full Circle is just a big part of education is mentorship and right. finding the right leaders and the right mm. the right people to trust and to guide you through yeah. your current adventure. Because in life, experience is, is such a huge part yeah. of the learning process. And if you don't have the experience, it's hard to know what something's right. going to be like. And to find someone like yourself who's been through it, been down this, however, mm. which way you traveled down it, mm. but you can pass that knowledge on now. And it's and, part of the healing too, being yeah. able to help. And sometimes people have to learn on their own. Yeah. But, you know, I've sat with artists and they've flown down to work with me and I've said, okay, the first day all we're going to do is talk. Yeah. I want to find out, you know, what you want to do. I remember this young band saying, we want to be this. We want to be Switchfoot. I'm like, yep. all right, well, okay. So when they started doing this, none of them were married. So they're sitting in a 15 passenger van driving around doing this stuff. Are you yep. prepared to do that? No. So I said, so really what you have to understand, you have to know what it takes to do what you're saying you want to do. Yeah. And I don't think you're willing to do that. Yeah. So even just, you know, like I've been on every side of this. I've been in anything from driving a car to a 15 passenger van to a tour bus to a private plane. Yep. You know, saying in 60 countries, I've been signed, I've been dropped, I've been signed, I've been dropped. I've been in the closing act, the opening act. I've signed publishing deals. I've had my own publishing company. I've produced, I've been produced. Yep. I've engineered, I've been engineered. I've sung on records, I've written records. I've been to the Grammys, I've done yep. Wonder Awards, blah, blah, blah. So when I sit down with these guys, I'm like, just so you know, this is what it looks like, what you're yep. saying. Just even to be able to help someone with that, bring that clarity yeah. is a part of healing for yourself because you're like, man, I went through this stuff, but God took me through this for a reason and he let me go through this. Oh, that's great, dude. That's <laughs> great. I mean, I, I just hope when I talk about this stuff that there's just one person that hears it and is encouraged or God speaks through something I'm saying. Otherwise, there's no point. Like I don't need to hear my voice anymore. I've had that enough in my life. I'm just hoping there's one person that that hears this and somehow through a miracle, the voice of God speaks to them and encourages them or rebukes them or gives them a little bit of information that they might need. I, I don't know. Yeah. No, I think Seth and I were talking about this yesterday, actually. We were sitting down with a gentleman from CCLI and we were talking about songwriting. And, you know, Seth had mentioned exactly what you were saying. It's like, you know, I'm outputting what's in my heart and what I feel like, you know, what I feel like is just coming out of me. And at the end of the day, yeah, if it reaches that one person, if that one person has an experience or finds, you know, finds relief or finds, you know, a guidance or whatever in, in this message that's pouring out of me, then, you know, yeah. all the better. That's great. Yeah. It's awesome. Thanks, Paul, man. Dude, thanks for coming on the show, man. It's been a pleasure to sit down and chat with you. Now, I was told I get paid per word, which is why I've stretched this out at 48 per, minutes. Per word is, you know, I think Matt's going to write the check for you. So <laughs> make sure to bring that up with him. Um, you know, he, I'm not really allowed to talk about didn't, money. Didn't Jesus say the lack of money is the root of all evil? I think... Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. The love of money. <laughs> My bad. Okay, so I'll just... It was an L word. We knew that. Yeah, I, I, I got the coffee. That'll do. Thanks, bud. Dude, thank you so much, man. We'll see you soon. All right, cheers. Hey, this is Zach O'Connor, and you've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This show is produced by the Full Circle Music Company with editing help from Jericho Scroggins and Jordan Salamone. We always love hearing from our listeners, so feel free to leave us a review on iTunes. Let us know what you think of the show. We're always looking for ways to make the show better and to bring you all the best content that we can. Also, don't forget, starting in October, we'll be having our production series of podcasts. We already have some insanely 
great guests lined up. So producers, songwriters, artists, whoever, get ready because this series will be packed full of new information that will help anyone in any part of the music industry and at any skill level. Beyond that, we'll have a few other production-based things happening, so stay on the lookout for it. If you're wondering the best way to keep up with all of this greatness, head on over to Instagram where you can keep up with all things Full Circle Music using at official FC music. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you all next week.